Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Well, we got Bob Pompiani on. It was just tremendous. My friend, welcome back. Great to have you with us. It's always a pleasure to be on your program. What's going on? Uh, not too much. What about you? Uh, not much either. I mean, we're trying to figure out what's wrong with the Penguins and how they can get better and at least get to the playoffs. But that they're kind of limping right now, and they got a big test tonight going against the Avalanche, followed by the Stars on back-to-back nights. That's not going to be easy for them, and they need points badly. Yeah, they do need points. You know what's interesting is that the older guys, Latang, Malkin, and Crosby, have actually been playing at a really high level. It's the guys surrounding them, I don't think, Bob, that have really played well, and that's been the part where they have not done a good job of filling in those spots around the contracts they have with the big guys. Totally correct, and it started in the offseason when Ron Hextall, when he brought the, everyone back, that's fine, but to your point, I mean, he signed Kasperi Kapitan to a two-year, $3 million per year, $6 million deal, which made no sense because he really didn't deserve it based on what he had shown here. And then uh, he gets... You know, Brock McGinn, a five year contract. Not The money wasn't great or anything, but still too much term. And then, you know, he signed Carter to an extension last year, before, and there's no reason for that. He, he could have played this. Now they owe him another year at 3.7, and he's been dead weight, to be honest. Um, they could have, instead of these signings, brought back Evan Rodriguez, who tonight will enter the game against the Penguins with 14 goals for the Avalanche. Uh, that's about 10 more than, than Kapanen had scored. Uh, they let, you know, Brandon Tanev and Jared McCann go. One in the expansion draft, one because they just couldn't afford him. And Jared McCann has 34 goals this year for Seattle. And Tanev has a big role to play with them. So there's so many things they could have done differently. They didn't. And as a result, they scrambled at the trade deadline and ended up with not much. And here they are. They have no, there is like nothing you can do to shake this team up right now because there's no moves they can make. No, there's no moves. The moves that had to be made early on to then set a foundation didn't work out because they weren't the right guys to fit with these because the three older guys have actually played at a really high level. It's the people around them that just have not, and that's been the crusher for them this right. year. No no question about that. No. Uh, uh, what are you going to do? That's, uh, that's hockey, and their goaltending has been erratic and injured. So that's another situation which will lead to this offseason question. Do they bring Tristan Jari back. He wants a lot of money, but I don't know that I could trust him. And that's that's the key. You need to trust that spot. You don't have trust in that spot. It doesn't matter what you have everywhere else. Whether what's the idea going to be? Let's go out and win like eight to seven every night. No, no, that's not, <laughs> no you can't do that. Not, <laughs> yeah. Although it is entertaining. <laughs> no, it is entertaining, but it's. I mean, that's not the way you're supposed to play hockey games, and very seldom does it get that. But you're right. It would be good if you said you can win those kind of games, but they can't right now because you can't do it with no. just those top three guys. You need more people contributing. No question. Uh, Penn State's going to have its pro day coming up on uh, Friday. And when you look at what the Steelers have done, I always feel like free agency sets up the draft, Bob. That then tells you what direction they want to go in the draft. How do you feel the Steelers have handled their free agency during the course of the last couple of weeks? Well, on paper, I would have to say, Steve, that they they did what they were supposed to do. And I thought yeah. that their offensive line, while young and inexperienced and while never missing a game, which is a rarity, they played okay, not great. But they also discovered that, you know, the guy they had at center last year, Kendra Green, can't even play, didn't ever play the game. He got bumped by Kevin Dotson, who wasn't all that much better. Um, Dan Moore is the tackle, and he gave up the most holding calls of anyone from his position. They brought in two free agents, and this year they brought in two more free agents. Last year was, uh, you know, uh, Mason Cole and uh, and Daniels at the guard position, and today uh, this year they brought in two more guys because they pretty much had to, um, which I'm encouraged by because I think they needed to get better. So yeah, uh, that's fine. They also totally dismantled their inside linebacking spot. All three guys who were here that they relied on heavily last year are going to be gone. Miles Jack just released. Devin Bush was a bust. And then Spillane signs with the Raiders, so they have a whole new cast of characters there, which I think needed to be done. They brought in Patrick Peterson, which tells me one thing. Now, you can tell me if I'm – if I'm, I'm going to put two and two together. I may get ten here, but 
Patrick Peterson was brought in for two reasons. Number one, because he still can play at his age. But I thought number two, because he can be a big help to somebody like Joey Porter Jr. if they decide yeah. to go in that direction because they still need a young, talented corner. So you give me what you think that, of, the, of that, that is, scenario. That, I think that is exactly the first thing I saw when they when they signed him is what A can play and B can mentor. And yeah. I think I think that's exactly what he can be. And it would be a big plus to Joey to do that. And Joey will be working out on Friday. Um, there, I, I've been reading that they might have some interest in Bud Dupree. What would you think about bringing him back? Only if it was a very, very affordable, very low price. Yes. Um, and that's fine for a low price. Again, you can. they've gone through people like that. Melvin Ingram, they bought right here a low price. You know, guys who've been around, but he's had a lot of injuries. That concerns me. They made the right move when they didn't retain him when Tennessee decided to sign him because he's been injured a lot. He hasn't really given them the bang for their buck, which is why he's now in a position where he's available. So only if the price was right would I do it. They they still need depth there and more people, so he knows the system, and when he's right, he could be a good player, but I, I it would have to be the right price. Yeah, and that's exactly right. It has to be the right number uh, to do that. I have to ask you about Cole Holcomb. He's a guy that has really overachieved at every level. He walked on at North Carolina. Then he ends up being a fifth-round pick. And then as a fifth-round pick, he gets himself now into this three-year deal. It seems like he's overachieved at every level. What did you think about that signing? Um, I thought it, you know, I thought it was a good signing. And I thought it because he was, he's a guy who is very active in the middle of making tackles. You still need that. You still got to stop run games, and still now I I question I still do anyone who's come here in the inside linebacker roles had a problem covering guys down the middle of the field, whether it's them or you know safeties who do that. Sometimes they put Terrell Edmonds up if he now he hasn't signed here yet, but if he does, he can you know in their sub package defense he becomes more than just a safety. But uh, I like it because he reminds me of a better version of Robert Spillane, who was an undrafted guy had to earn his way through practice squads in Tennessee and eventually in Pittsburgh, and then he you know, emerged as a good guy. Now he got a nice deal with the, the Raiders. Same kind of you know profile. Uh, not much thought coming into a draft. He was a fifth-round pick, as you said. Blaine was undrafted, but that means the odds are stacked against you, and you have to really earn it. You can't make money unless you earn it, so he's done that. And hopefully we've seen uh, you know a better version of him in the next few years here than we've seen from before, but I have no problem with that signing. I think I think it was a very affordable yeah. one too. Yeah, in fact, that goes back to a point we made on the show many times. If you're a first through third round pick, you really have to play your way out of the league. Yeah. If you were a if you Nine were a four, <laughs> yep, if you were a four to seven or a free agent, you had to play your way into the league to get the second contract. And to his credit, he he got a second contract, and he deserved it. Yes, yeah, so that's that's good for them and. Um, hopefully he can live up to that. But they still need to do more things, and this draft will be interesting to me uh, to see what, exactly what they do. Uh, but they discovered, you know, on offense, Jalen Warren was a nice little pickup as an undrafted guy, speaking mm-hmm. of undrafted. Came mm-hmm. in and gave them a nice little option besides uh, Najee Harris. Uh, I think Fryer moves, I, I mean, that dude is getting better every year I see, and you know him well. And, and so I would expect him to continue to take that next step to become – uh, I'm not going to put him in the George Kittle, um, you know, Travis Kelsey situation yet. But, I mean, a guy who can be a productive 85-catch guy, I think he can handle that and be a big red zone threat. So, But I still think they need one more wide receiver, too, somewhere along the way. I'm not sure I was where about to bring that up. I was about to bring that up. And I don't think – it's not just a wide receiver. I think at minimum they need to find a slot receiver somewhere. How do you view that? Well, they're hoping Calvin Austin can be what they thought he was last year before he got injured and missed the entire season. So he's got the speed. He's the fastest guy on the team, I think. And if he can figure out a role for himself, uh, that would be terrific because it's, it's almost like you, you add a guy that you didn't have to do anything to this year. He just He's there and he's healthy. But he has to be healthy. Um, but I still think they want, they're want they going to look for another – somebody who can get down the field more. Um you know, Deontay Johnson could do it. I still think he can do it. Uh, they got to put him in positions to do it. Uh, he's to me, he's a slant guy. Whether that's short, shallow, or deeper slants, you get him the ball and the money, and Pickett's shown the ability to do that. He can turn that into big plays. He hasn't had too many opportunities 
Last year was kind of a weird year because they started with Trubisky and they, they're all conservative. Everything's so it didn't fit in his game. Although he didn't, you know, and you have too many drops, you didn't score a touchdown. It's hard to believe, but um, I, I expect him to get better too, just because you can't get worse from that point of view. Yeah, but that because you bring up Pickett, for example, I mean, it's it's a different animal. I think going into a training camp. This is something the Steelers are used to. They're used to going to training camp knowing who the quarterback's going to be. Last year, there were you know, there were doubts one way or the other. So at least you feel like in that part, the Steelers are going back to at least knowing who the quarterback is on day one. Absolutely. And you know, the, the best part about this, if you're them, is that you know how teams search for years to find the quarterback that oh. can be their next, you know, franchise guy. If they get develops into that and, and he's shown certainly as the year went on that he has a lot of the moxie to do it they will have really abbreviated the time needed to find their next guy after Ben Roethlisberger and you would think that would be hard for them to do that they don't necessarily draft in the top 10 all the time in fact very seldom unless they trade up there so they would while some teams still struggle to find those guys they picked him when a lot of teams last year could have picked him and chose not to pick him which I was a little bit surprised that no quarterback went in the first three rounds except him. So right. that quarterback class, you have to agree. Uh, were you surprised that nobody, you know, I, I thought quarterbacks are such important people in, in organizations that uh, that the, the teams would take them just because they're quarterbacks. And they were, right. you know, many of them highly thought of, I thought, but apparently not. But you know what? It's interesting. If you ask every year the top 32 players, a lot of times you'll see, like, Let's just do an average. Four or five, four quarterbacks will go in the first round, and three of them aren't among the top 32 players in the draft, but because of the position, they're drafted. Yeah. yeah. And this year we'll see that. I bet you we said run on quarterbacks yeah. oh, yeah. just because all these Tim Carolina is going to be interesting to see what they do. Right, Exa- exactly. Uh, do you have a feel on on how Omar – we know not pretty much how Kevin Colbert took care of the draft – do you have any feel yet about how Omar Khan likes to do it, or is this still a learning process for everybody as to how he goes about his business? No, I, Well, I've known him for a long time. and I mean, you know him from the financial side mostly because that was his um, yeah. you know, mission here. Is to, he's very good with the cap numbers, very, and he's, that's still a very important part of this. But I think he's more he's, – he's not, not afraid to be aggressive uh, in certain times and certain things. I think, you know, we've seen evidence of that uh, with some of the stuff they did. They traded Chase Claypool midseason for a second-round pick, or not midseason, whenever they traded for him. Uh, normally, you don't see that kind of activity from them. Uh, now that second pick could be a big pick for them because it comes, and they'll have a lot of time to debate who they want because it comes on the first one of the second round. So yeah. they'll have a whole night to sleep on it. But, you know, that's that shows me. Uh, but I think it's a combination of him and Andy Weidel too. They brought him over for a reason. He's the guy who's going to put together their board. He is the he has the scouts mentality. He knows all that kind of stuff. But you know, people laugh at when they hear the, the Steelers talk about it. That, that they are they operate like collective, like a group. They 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 go in there and they debate it all like everybody else. And I think they come to a consensus. Although I still believe Mike Tomlin has his final say on what goes on. But all the information that they'll take into account and, and they'll make their choice. So it'll be similar to what Kevin Colbert did, but I think he can be a little bit more aggressive at times. My friend, it's always a pleasure. Just great talking with you. Not Q&A, just talking with you. I appreciate it so much. I, I, I love doing it any time. You're one of the best in the business, so it's easy for me to talk to you. I love doing it. You too, my man. I can say the same thing about you. Thank you so much, Bob. Anytime. Steve, you, you call, bet. I'll be answering. <laughs> you got it.